So hey, this is Josh. Welcome back to the Accelerated Investor Podcast. In this episode, I am interviewing Paul Moore. Paul is the founder and managing partner of Wellings Capital. He's completed over 85 real estate investments and exits. He's appeared on HGTV's House Hunters. He's rehabbed and managed dozens of rental properties. He's developed a subdivision and a Hyatt Hotel. Uh, Paul narrowed his focus to commercial real estate back in 2010 and today runs Wellings Capital, which is a basically a private equity shop, if you will. They set up closed-ended funds and recently raised over $30 million to partner with operators who are investing in mobile home parks and self-storage units. So in this interview, you're going to hear number one, how Paul raised nearly $30 million this year to put into his fund. Number two, his fund structure and how he partners with operators to help them with the down payment and the value add improvements on their mobile home parks and self-storage units. Number three, Paul's gonna explain how he's able to invest virtually all over the country by partnering with owner operators. Number four, Paul and I discuss his Rules for Real Estate Investing According to Warren Buffett. Uh, Paul is actually coming out with a book uh, called Warren Buffett's Rules for Real Estate Investing. And these are philosophies that Warren Buffett has for his investments that would apply to real estate investing. And finally, number five, you're going to hear 10 ways to add value to mobile home parks and self-storage units to nearly double their value and their equity for investors. I hope you enjoy this interview on the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Paul Moore. Welcome to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you're looking to retire early with forever passive income, you're in the right place. This podcast is the go-to destination for real estate investors, both active and passive, and multifamily apartment investors, both new, intermediate, and advanced. Now, sit back, listen, learn, and accelerate your business, your life, and your investing with the Accelerated Investor Podcast. So, hey, Paul, listen, I've been looking forward to this interview on our Accelerated Investor Podcast for a long time. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Josh. Absolutely. So, Paul, listen, you know, I'm always curious when I get to interview somebody new, meet somebody new, what they're working on, like literally today or like this afternoon or tomorrow, next week that they're most excited about, whether it's a new development deal or a new investment or a new book. Uh, so I'm curious, like, what are you working on right now that's kind of getting you going that you're passionate for? Yeah, I'm working on a couple of things. So first of all, we are raising uh, $30 million to invest in recession-resistant commercial real estate. We are a few million dollars away from the limit. And so when we wrap that up, we will be, uh, we'll be taking a little bit of a break and then pushing start on a new fund in the next couple months. So we're very excited about that. I'm also really excited about my latest book. It's Warren Buffett's Rules for Real Estate Investors. What we're doing is we're taking Buffett's principles that he's laid out for us so well over the last 30 or 40 years, and we're taking that and applying that to real estate investing. In other words, we'd say, Warren, if you were investing in real estate, what would you do in this situation or that situation? It's going to be about 22 chapters. It's going to be Morgan James Publishing, and we're really excited to get that wrapped up. I'm only a few chapters away. Fantastic. So is there some place that our audience can like pre-reserve a spot? Is there... Somewhere I think it's a little you're... too soon. Yeah, okay. I'd love to tell you. I mean, you can always go to my website. It'll be when it's out, when it's available, it'll be on my website. Okay, fantastic. So let's peel back the onion a little bit um, uh, on that. It's wellingscapital.com, by the way, for those of you that want to mm-hmm. check out Paul's information in this upcoming book. So let's talk about the $30 million raise. So you said recession-proof 
real estate investing. Obviously, COVID created this recession yeah. that nobody forecasted. So when you say the words recession-proof real estate, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I should have said recession resistant. So let oh, me be clear okay. on that. But uh, yeah, we've got, uh, we, you know, we've found that a couple asset classes have done really well through the last recession. And there's just a lot of fundamentals that make these type of things work well. And, and that would be self-storage and mobile home parks. Let me focus on the second one. Sure. Mobile home parks are the only asset type that have a decreasing supply and an increasing demand every year, Josh. So we really like that asset type. People generally don't move out. I mean, if imagine uh, you had a mobile home that you'd spent thirty, forty thousand on, or maybe you were just buying it slowly, you know, owner financing or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and you got a seventeen dollar raise on your rent. You didn't like that. You're probably not going to spend five or six thousand dollars to move it down the street to save seventeen dollars or because you're mad at your neighbor or the right. manager. It's just not feasible to do that. In fact, it virtually never happens. And so that's one of the reasons we like this. It's sticky tenants. We also like the fact that the tenants generally own their own mobile home. So there's no interior maintenance. There's no right. building maintenance. We're basically leasing land to them and providing them a beautiful, safe place to live. And so those are some of the things we love about mobile home park investing. Got it. I love it. Yeah. So recession resistant also because, you know, a lot of people can afford the price for a mobile mm -hmm. home, whether they finance it yeah. or whether they owner finance it. Um, now you said something that stuck out to me, which is supply keeps going down. Is that yeah. simply because the cans are aging out and they're no longer uh, usable? Uh, I've never heard somebody <laughs> describe a mobile home park or mobile homes mm -hmm. as actually having supply go down. So help me understand. Yeah. So it's really hard to track because it's such an extremely fragmented business, but we believe there are 44,000 mobile home parks in the U.S., 85 to 90% owned by mom and pop operators, which I'll jump back into later. Mm -hmm. But um, the nimbyism, which is the not in my backyard ism attitude of most cities and even, you know, uh, suburban areas don't want new mobile home parks. And in fact, um, the city councils, the planning and zoning people sometimes manipulate the owners of mobile home parks to get rid of them so they will before they approve their next subdivision or whatever next project they want to do. Now, in addition to that, it's actually quite unprofitable to start a new mobile home park. In fact, it often right. can take 10 to 15 years to get to break even for most operators. Those that can get approved by city or county zoning are so far out on the sticks that they fill up really, really slowly. And so the combination of these factors means that there's not a lot of new supply. Now, as far as the decreasing supply every year, we believe that about 100 mobile home parks a year are being torn down or evacuated. In fact, I was in Fairbanks, Alaska recently, and mm -hmm. I saw a completely vacated mobile home park. All it had is a bunch of old pieces of decks and steps and stuff like that. In fact, there were three more that I found that were possibly going to be vacated as well. Wow, wow. Are you ready to automate and explode your real estate investing? We're searching for extremely motivated individuals who are sick and tired of wasting time and want to finally see real results from their real estate investing business. We're searching for investors looking to get to the next level and become a bigger, better version of themselves while being a more successful real estate investing entrepreneur. Apply for mentoring and coaching at joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. That's joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. So between the cans, between the parks, between the lack of desire from city management, um, all going down, yet we have a affordability issue, right? The United States is facing really a affordability crisis with apartments, 
with lack of supply for residential homes, prices going up uh, for both multifamily apartments and for homes. And what I've always thought is one of the areas where you could easily replace that with affordable housing was mobile home parks. Uh, but cost of building, cost of developing a park, uh, supply going down, but demand going up. So tell me a little bit more about demand. Is it because of affordability and affordable housing that people can afford those payments that are looking at mobile home parks and constantly looking to move in? And because anytime you can find a, a business model where you know there's going to be more demand but less supply, the prices have to go up. And of course, your returns are there. So help me understand the demand side of mobile home parks. Yeah, it's crazy to think this, but 10,000 people, Josh, turn 65 every day in the U.S. What's wow, crazier yeah. is that six out of 10 have less than $10,000 saved for retirement, but many of them have home equity and they're willing sometimes to trade that home equity in to get a mobile home park lifestyle with lower cost of living. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have paper thin walls next to their neighbor. They don't have to climb a whole bunch of steps. They really are willing to do a mobile home park. A friend of mine's father in California was a very successful doctor, got pictures of him with Gerald Ford playing golf. But when he retired, he decided to move into a mobile home park and he was very happy there. And so this is not your grandfather's mobile home park in some cases. Right. You know, some of them are pretty crummy and run down, but a lot of the ones we buy are the same ones that Blackstone is buying right now mm -hmm. that have, you know, top flight uh, amenities, pools, community rooms, et cetera, playgrounds, dog parks. And uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, Sam Zell, the top real estate investor in the U.S., in my opinion, mm -hmm. has 157,000 mobile home park pads. He was buying these quietly while the rest of us were turning our nose up. I think he knew something we didn't know. Right. Yeah, Sam Zell, and you've already mentioned Warren Buffett, right, are essentially yeah. – brought the mobile home park industry yes. into the modern age with the yep. financing, the way they finance right. these parks. And so be interesting to hear more about your your book, what's in your book, because Warren Buffett said, like, if I could go buy 100,000 single family homes, I would do it, but it's not economical. So what did he do? Right. He founded Berkshire Hathaway to sell properties and he invested in mobile home parks and created the financing around mobile home parks. So Paul, for people who don't know, Talk about that evolution a little bit about the old school mom and pop parks and the financing around those parks versus what's actually happening today that makes these so attractive. What's so crazy is a lot of the sellers of mobile home parks, the mom and pop owners who have been you know, with those parks since the 60s or 70s, they assume that everybody has to uh, owner finance. So, so they're already assuming you know, that they might be owner financing. And if they haven't kept up with the times, they might think that these are selling for a 10 or 12% cap rate. Mm -hmm. When they find out that they can sell for a 6% cap rate and the buyer can get Fannie or Freddie Mac financing, right? you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and other, uh, you know, CMBS lenders are jumping into the space. Uh, it's great for the seller and they're often quite surprised. The buyer can sometimes get financing in the threes, in the 3% interest rate range, similar to multifamily. Mm -hmm. And in fact, they have some of the uh, Freddie programs have two guaranteed supplementals on them at the same interest rate right up front. So it's pretty cool financing. And uh, this has allowed, I think Sam Zell's responsible for some of this. Like you said, Berkshire Hathaway has Berkadia Mortgage. They also have 21st Mortgage that finances individual mobile homes up to 100% for a 30-year-old year old mobile home in some cases. Fantastic stuff. So you had mentioned, I'm curious to hear more about this $30 million raise. Is it, Are you structuring the capital in a close-ended fund where you're raising the 30 million into a close-ended fund and then going and buying the assets with that 30 million, matching it up with some commercial financing. Help me understand the structure and where the 30 million is going. Yeah, close. So we were actually a multifamily operator. I wrote a book on multifamily, humbly entitled The Perfect yeah. Investment. And uh, we... <laughs> 
realize that multifamily is largely overheated, as you know, Josh. Mm -hmm. And so our, we didn't have a great acquisition pipeline. We were kind of frustrated. Well, we were really frustrated. And so we started looking at self-storage and mobile home parks, found out about the fragmented nature of that, those industries, which I'll get back into in a few minutes. And um, we decided to set up a fund and go out and be due diligence partners for our investors. And what I mean by that mm. is we go out and find the very best operators, we place capital with them, and then they invest in the self-storage and mobile home parks. Right now we have, nice. uh, we have $21 million placed right now across 74 projects. And by the end of the raise, we'll be closer to 100 projects that we have invested in. So our investors get diversification across uh, four operators right now, lots of geographies, lots of assets and different strategies as well. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And, you know, to do a close ended type fund each year, right? It makes obviously the accounting much easier because ble right. bleeding the accounting over year after year is very difficult. But I love the fact that, Paul, you've really structured your business to do what you know you're good at. So going and sourcing operators, finding the best operators that are running the mobile home parks. Again, the Fannie Freddie financing is there, but sometimes it's only available at 60 to 65, maybe 70 cents on the dollar. So there's a large, a little bit larger downstroke on mobile homes. And you know that the returns are there, decreasing supply, increasing demand, all amazing things. But what does the operator need is help with the downstroke uh, to be able to match that up. And as we all know, multifamily real estate, commercial real estate is very much a team game, right? Where somebody's signing to sponsor the loan, somebody else is running the operations, somebody else is raising the capital. Um, and so if you've aligned yourself with the passive investors and the operators to kind of match the two up, right. and I'm sure there's the economics there for you as some sort of general partner or equity owner, um, love the model, love the model. So Paul, how did this model, you did this model come out of, you mentioned that multifamily largely overheated and you started looking at mobile home parks as an alternative. When did you realize that this structure was a winning structure? Like what did, what, when the light bulb went off in your head and you're like, oh my God, this is really going to work. Tell me about that epiphany. I always like those moments, those entrepreneurial moments Yeah. when you're like, oh my, I've got this idea. It's going to come together. Yeah. Well, I mean, as far as the fund model, that was pretty easy jump from doing individual syndications because, mm -hmm. you know, like we all know, some go well, some are pretty mediocre. And I felt bad for the investors who were in the mediocre ones. I mean, I was one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, if, if four out of five are winners and a few are home runs and then a few are mediocre, wouldn't it be nice to put it in a fund structure to give people diversification? diversification and so love it. I don't ever plan to go back to the individual asset model, though we're willing to look at it um, in the future. The yeah. light bulb for me, though, went on when I realized the difference between intrinsic and extrinsic value. Warren Buffett said, what you pay for is essentially the extrinsic value, but what you get is the intrinsic value. In other words, the price is what you pay. The value right. is what you get. And so when I realized there was a massive gulf between intrinsic and extrinsic value on many of these fragmented assets, these mom and pop owned assets, the mom and pop owners don't have the desire or the knowledge or the resources to increase income and right. maximize value. Right. So we could pay, for example, uh, a year ago last week, we bought a 7.1, we invested in a $7.1 million mobile home park in Kentucky. Uh, the operator went in and passed utilities back to the uh, tenants, raised rates a little bit, slashed expenses, improved the park, and we had a target of hitting 12 to $13 million resale in three to four years. Mm. We got an offer of $15 million in six nice. months, sold oh the gosh. property. Yeah, sold the property in a total of 10 months of ownership for 15 million. That was a three and a half million dollar equity in uh, about $10 million of equity out. Oh, so a nice 344% IRR. Good for you, good for you. My newest and most powerful real estate investing book, The Flip System, is now available 
And for a limited time, you can grab your free copy at getflipsystem.com forward slash podcast. Using the same proven principles, secrets, and investing strategies I'm sharing in this book, I've been able to personally close over 750 highly profitable real estate deals over the last 15 years, make over 400 private lender loans, raise over $30 million of private money, and acquire over 2,000 units of apartments. Get my newest book now for free for a limited time at getflipsystem.com slash podcast. That's getflipsystem.com slash podcast. So Paul, I'm listening. I, I know, I know we're, you've got an obligation. I want to be uh, mindful of your time. So, uh, but I am curious to peel back the onion a little bit more on this book. So there's probably some lessons that you're going to pour into the book. Again, it's things from Warren Buffett that you've learned and watched his style. Yeah. So what are some of the other philosophies that Warren has, Sam Zell has, some of these other guys that are, you're going to, you're going to have in the book, uh, uh, you know, the intrinsic mm-hmm. value that, that that's, I'm sure going to end up in the book. So what, what are some of the other philosophies that you really like about Warren's style for real estate investors and maybe even some chapter titles, maybe these are chapters of the book. What are some of the things that are going to enter the book that you think our audience should know? Yeah. So one would be this, um, uh, I, there's so many floating in my head. I don't know which one to sure. tell you about, but one that I really love is there's a big difference between investing and speculating. Investing is when your principal is generally safe and you've got a chance to make a return. Speculating is when your principal is not at all safe and you've got a chance to make a return. Paul Samuelson was the first economist to win the Nobel Peace Prize from the US. And he said that investing should be boring. It should be like watching paint dry (laughs) Love or that. watching grass grow. He said, if you want excitement, take $800 and go to Las Vegas. Yeah. I love Las Vegas too. But you know, that's not where we invest, right? That's where we speculate right. and have fun. That's yeah. great. Is, is, there, is there another lesson that sticks out that you think is going to enter the book? Yeah. So my default as an entrepreneur for the early part of my entrepreneurial career, I left Ford Motor Company, you know, when I was in my 20s. And I started uh, as an entrepreneur in my early years, my default as somebody who liked to take risks, who liked to roll the dice, play double or nothing, my default was to say yes. Warren Buffett said, successful people say no almost all the time, but the Mm -hmm. very most successful people say no virtually every time. And so that's what Buffett does. And that just really shocked me because I used to assume that I wanted to figure out how to make something work. But now we try to figure out ways to shoot something down and only Mm -hmm. invest if it passes all the tests. And once we took that mindset, we grew a lot slower than we could have. But I tell you what, we've been a lot more successful. That's great stuff, Paul. That's great advice. I love that. And you know, the interesting thing is as an entrepreneur, Everybody talks about, uh, you know, going networking, learning, constantly being, you know, in meetings with meetup groups or on bigger pockets or, uh, you know, going to events and meeting people. Um, so there's this sort of, you know, dichotomy, if you will, between I'm going to go run and meet people and network. And a lot of the best deals are those kind of club deals that are done with people that we know, that we like, that we trust. But you're also saying you got to say no to a lot of that stuff. And I think that's where the entrepreneurial genius happens is where someone is an entrepreneur and is out and has lots of contacts and gets involved in learning gets involved in learning about a lot of deals before they get involved in deals and says no, says no, says no, says no. And then ultimately, they're really good at picking winners. Everyone's, nobody's perfect. Nobody's going to win 100% of the time. But um, I think when I was a lot less mature as an entrepreneur and a business owner, I would go network and everything looked great. Everything was a shiny object. We wanted to do every deal. We said yes to everything. And then we're like, oh my God, I'm bleeding cash. My cash flow is terrible. I'm in 14 different markets and niches. What am I doing? 
I think that maybe is the ultimate lesson I think that Paul's pulling out here is let's go network. Let's spend time learning about lots of deals. Say no to almost all of them. Pick the winners. Uh, fantastic stuff, Paul. So I'm interested to hear your take. You know, we talked about mobile homes. You also mentioned self-storage. Uh, tell me why self-storage is, again, recession, recession resistant and yeah. why you'll be talking about that in the book as well. Yeah. So self-storage um, has uh, an amazing runway over the last several decades. And um, one of the things I love about self-storage is that the tenants are very sticky. Imagine I was renting you a $1,000 apartment and I raised your rent 6%. Right. You might move rather than sign that lease and add $60 a month to your payments and $720 a year. But if I'm renting you a $100 self-storage facility and I raise your rent by 6% and you're on a month-to-month <laughs> -month basis, you're probably not going to spend a Saturday or a vacation day loading up a U-Haul to yeah. move all your junk, I mean, all your treasures down the street to <laughs> right. save $6 a month. In fact, we were describing this to a doctor investor one day and he said, oh my goodness, I just remembered I've had a self-storage facility charge hitting my credit card for seven years and I forgot about it till just now. Oh my gosh. So it's, and he's, and he invested. And so the, the point is self-storage is a small part of people's uh, general income or their net worth or their situation. And so if they're downsizing in a bad time from a 4,000 to a 2,000 square foot home or a 2,000 square foot to a, an apartment, they're generally looking for a place to store their stuff. Oh, yeah. If they're going through a divorce or downsizing or they're moving, uh, you know, they're closing down an office to work from home or a restaurant, they're generally looking for a place to store their stuff. If their parents pass away, like mine did, and they've got a bunch of stuff they need to sort out, they might want to store it for a month that turns into 2.6 years. Right. And so <laughs> self-storage has a lot of great stuff going for it. And while it's overbuilt in certain markets, Josh, and we can all see that if we live near a city, it's underbuilt in many, many markets still. And there's a tremendous upside. We just invested in one in Ramsey, Minnesota a few years ago. And that it's the it's the only facility outside an industrial park in Ramsey, which is a booming wow. suburb of Minneapolis. So there's great opportunities still in self-storage. The best opportunity is to take a mom and pop self-storage like we did in Beeville, Texas, add U-Haul, mm -hmm. decrease costs, increase marketing, increase occupancy, decrease delinquency, and do some other things like add locks, boxes, tape, scissors, showroom, uh, late fees, admin fees, insurance, all those value adds. And you can sometimes double the value of the investor's equity. In fact, even more than double that in one to two years. And we've got one after the other case study proving this internally. That's fantastic stuff, Paul. Listen, I know you got to run. I just, I, I wanted to ask you if there's any kind of final kind of words of advice that maybe you would give our audience or give your younger former self You've had a lot of success. You've, you, you know yeah. a lot about a lot, which I appreciate you sharing some of that today. But what, if anything, would you do different? What advice would you give your younger, uh, younger Paul that you might do differently if you could do it all over again? Yeah, back on that issue of um, speculating versus investing, you know, I used to think this low risk leads to low return, high risk, therefore, leads to. Yeah. No, it doesn't lead to high return. It leads to the potential for high return and the potential for lots of losses. Catastrophic loss in some uh, cases. No kidding, right? And I had that many, many times, including a wireless internet company I started, which had no business doing in North Dakota, where the 40 degree below temperatures froze the radios. And also a number of other things that I describe on my podcast called How to Lose Money. We've nice. interviewed 238 investors, entrepreneurs, and business owners, and they've told us their painful stories on the way to the top. And investing versus speculating, chasing shiny objects, quitting too soon or waiting too long to quit 
have been some of the greatest lessons that we've learned over and over on our show. Fantastic stuff, Paul. Listen, thank you so much for joining me today on Accelerated Investor and sharing all this wisdom. All right, Josh, it was really an honor to be here, man. Thank you so much. Hey, Josh here. And do you want to win a free Accelerated Investor t-shirt? All you have to do is give Accelerated Investor, our podcast, Accelerated Investor, a rating and a review on iTunes. Okay, do that now. Then send us a screenshot on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. What we're going to do then is every week we're going to pick our favorite rating and review and we're going to send that person a free t-shirt and maybe again some other cool fun stuff as well from Accelerated Investors. So again, don't forget to take a screenshot, leave a rating, review, take a screenshot, send it to us so we know exactly who you are and then once a week, every week on the podcast, we will announce a new winner. Don't forget to take a screenshot and send it to us so we know exactly who you are. We'll announce a new winner every week. You were just listening to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. If you enjoyed this episode and learned something new, help us build the AI community by leaving a review and five-star rating on our iTunes podcast channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. To see passive investing opportunities, visit freelandventures.com slash passive. To start your journey toward the lifestyle you've always dreamed of with multifamily apartments, apply for one-on-one -on -one coaching with Josh at www.joshcantwellcoaching.com.